Hi, this is Guy Wallace with a new video in my new series entitled Adventures in Performance-Based Training and Development, also known as the Insomnia Solution. But not for my insomnia, but for yours. Just kidding. Today I'd like to talk about curriculum architecture design, the methodology and a little bit about the history of where this all comes from. Back in 1981, I had joined Motorola's Training and Education Center, and Bill Wiggenhorn was bringing in a bunch of gurus to help orient his staff to where he wanted the organization to go, what he wanted it to become, which was basically performance-based training and development. Um, he brought in Gary Rumler. I came in one week early from my official start date to attend a one-day workshop that uh, Dr. Rumler put on. The next week, my first day on the job, he brought in Neil Rackham, who would later become known for spin selling. Neil Rackham is the big guru behind the spin selling uh, methodology, consultative approach to uh, selling. And one of the people he brought in and over the next couple of weeks, I don't recall the details here, but he brought, brought in this guy, Ray Svensson who was a consultant in the local area, and Ray was helping Bill with doing some strategic planning for the training and development function that Bill was putting into place. Um, as part of strategic planning, and this is in Ray's 1986 book, the strategic planning, the training and development strategic planning workbook, uh, a component of that is doing what was called curriculum architecture. Now this idea came out of the Bell System Center for Technical Education and they were attending to the needs of the engineering populations across all of the United States of America's Bell operating companies, but they'd also included an audience of uh, instructional technologists, or excuse me, uh, information technologists. They had bumped instructional technology when they went from Management Information Systems, MIS, to IT, Information Technology. So that group had thought, well, what we really need and want is a curriculum architecture, much like the architecture of lines of programming, where you can take a bunch of lines of programming and use it in multiple products, uh, different software programs. Um, so, but Ray talked about this, and it was a, an approach to modular curriculum. Well, this really resonated with me, and I had a project that I was soon to undertake the ABCs of management, as my uh, 30 manufacturing operations managers uh, called it. And so I decided I'm going to do this. Um, and so I did my best uh, performance analysis, a la what I had learned from a derivative of a derivative of Gary Rummler's methodology. While well, I was working with Gary at the time on several projects, because Bill had him in as a consultant, but uh, I had learned a d slightly different approach, a derivative of a derivative again, if you will. And uh, so I did that, and then I uh, started systematically deriving, based on the performance model, what the enabling knowledge and skills were. Now my audiences were across five business sectors, as uh, Motorola called them, strategic business unit, SBUs is a more prevalent term. But um, so there was a mixed audience. They didn't have all the same performance context. Uh, yet you know, on one hand, you know, a supervisor is a supervisor is a supervisor. Yet, you know, they're dealing in a different environment with different policies and procedures, etc. So I created a modular training and development path. And I had taped together a bunch of blank flip chart pages and done a, uh, you know, what I learned from Gary Rummler was the uh, swim lane process maps, which he invented. And I saw this back in 1981. It was part of that first day's presentation looking at swim lane maps. And so I used that as a kind of a foundation of a training and development path. And, you know, if you were a new supervisor, you might need a module on welcome to Motorola. You might need a module of content on welcome to your business sector, <coughs> um, SBU. Um, and then welcome to your facility because there were multiple manufacturing sites within the manufacturing world. There were 30 manufacturing uh, managers. Uh, so there were minimally 30 different sites that they controlled. So I had created this path with these five swim lanes in it, each for each of the strategic uh, business units, business sectors, so they could see exactly what you know I was thinking that their people would need. And here's the common stuff that crossed all five of those uh, 
paths, if you will, all compiled into one path. But anyway, so I had this up on the, the wall of my cubicle. It went across two of the walls, and I was uh, I was one of the new later uh, people to join the organization as a uh, training project supervisor. There were 13 of us. But people would come to the far corner of the office where the cube farm was, if you will, and my office was way in the back. Uh, actually, it was kind of cool because I had a window close by and I could see uh, daylight and, and uh, when evening approached and nighttime came, I was well aware of what time of day it was, even if I was working late. But everybody came back to my cubicle to look at this thing. And Bill Wiggenhorn came back to look at this because it was a big buzz. Everybody was talking about this. See what guy has produced. And so everybody came back and did that. And so I, I, that became kind of uh, known uh, as an approach to doing what Ray Svensson had called critic and architecture. Uh, later on, uh, my, my wife had gone to work for Ray Svensson. Bill Wiggenhorn had put the two of them together and suggested to Ray that he hire Karen. So Karen had joined him in January of 82. Uh, later on, uh, Ray uh, and Karen came to me in the summer of 82 and said, we've done this analysis for Exxon Exploration USA for geologists and geophysicists. And we would like you to take our analysis data and construct a training and development path similar to what you had done for the five different audiences at Motorola's Manufacturing Supervisors. So I worked two weekends over that summer to put this thing together. They took it to their client who loved it because it was modular, you know, and it, one of the things that I learned from Bill Wiggenhorn, uh, one of the uh, things that he challenged us to do was to move as much content from group-paced means, instructor-led training back in the day, uh, to self-paced and where it was appropriate to move as much of the content, the instructional content, to self-paced means because that made it more flexible for the participants in training, the learners, if you will, um, and their management. So they could get what they needed right away. They didn't have to wait for some class to be scheduled and to roll around here. And too often, you know, the class was full. So you couldn't go to the next one. You'd have to go to the one after that or even the one after that. Very annoying. So Bill came back from a bunch of field visits and said, you know, we've, we've got to do this. We've got to do this for our clientele, the people out there in uh, the Motorola uh, operations, if you will. Um, so I took that to heart <clears throat> and I addressed all of the training for Exxon Exploration Geologists and Geophysicists back in the summer of 1982 and created a series of self-paced modules. Um, so that uh, the, the theory was, you know, the supervisor would administrate that, they would sign Guy up, they would, you know, give Guy the module to read. If there was a, a practice with feedback on anything uh, or to show your work, the supervisor would be involved in that and they would, you know, score it. There was no tests, if you will. Uh, Motorola had a policy when I first joined that there was no testing. They had created tests in the past, 10 years earlier, and when the supervisors out in the world and managers out in their world used those tests to deny people promotions and to promote others, they were sued and they lost because the tests were invalid as determined in the court of law. So there was a general rule, no testing. So I didn't do testing in my Motorola stuff. I didn't do it with, uh, with Exxon, although we did give hints and tips to both the learner and their supervisors as to what the performance criteria were so that it could be used by the individual taking the training to self-judge their own performance, their work, their tasks, and their outputs, as well as for the supervisors to do that. Anyway, the thing was a huge, huge win, and that was my first uh, curriculum architecture, if you will, as a consultant, because a couple of months later, I joined Ray and Karen. I left Motorola, left a whole bunch of projects with uh, <laughs> that I was working with uh, Dr. Gary Rummler with, and uh, I joined them, and my first work was to build out some of the modules of this curriculum for Exxon, uh, so that they could, we, we created two modules and we backed out a template and we gave the template to the field who had already run ahead and started producing content, but it was a mishmash of stuff and uh, 
we needed to get ahead, back ahead of the curve, if you will, rather than lagging. So the headquarters training organization in Houston, Texas had to produce something. But anyway, so that was uh, my first two experiences at Motorola and with, uh, with Exxon working as a subcontractor, if you will, uh, to Ray Svensson and his consulting organization. Uh, my wife and I uh, had our own firm then. It was the Wallace Works. Uh, later on, she became an official partner of Ray's, and I was kind of a shadow partner because our accountant had said, you know, uh, one of you should stay back and maintain this uh, organization uh, for tax purposes, of course. Um, anyway, so that was uh, um, my pro my start up with this thing called curriculum architecture design. Um, so at Ray's organization, uh, you know, flying under his uh, uh, banner, so to speak, I became the curriculum architecture design guy. I did my own analysis leading to designs of curriculum architecture training and development paths. Um, and I also worked with Ray and Karen's analysis data when they did projects. And then we began to grow our staff and there were others. Mark Graham Brown was another person and a series of people after that. But uh, when they would go out and do their analysis, I was always brought in to do the curriculum architecture design and to work with the team of master performers and other subject matter experts and take the analysis data that had been generated and convert that into a training and development path. Well, one of the issues that I kept confronting was that there was my business partners, so to speak, and the other staff were doing analysis differently, one effort to the next. And it was driving me crazy because sometimes there was data that I needed, really wanted, for the curriculum architecture design. So we'd have to take time out in the design effort to go back and backfill some of the analysis data that was missing. And I thought, well, there's a better way to do this. So I started standardizing it. And I was able to do that for our staff but trying to get my two business partners to standardize to my approach for this was, as Gary Rumler once put it, uh, pushing 50 feet of wet rope. It, it just didn't work very well. So uh, my trick was then to later on create a database, which is very unforgiving because either you have the data for all the fields or you do not. And the holes in your data would be apparent once we put it into the database and spit it back out in reports and we could see, oh, there's a bunch of stuff missing here. So what's the answers to these things? So that I could facilitate a curriculum architecture design meeting with some confidence that I could get the whole thing done in the allotted time without having to back up and start doing a bunch of analysis work to pull this all together. Um, so I, uh, so that specialty was mine, and uh, um, I had done a whole bunch of these by the time in 1983, just a year and a half later after joining Ray, we wrote an article uh, that got published in Training Magazine in September of 1984 on curriculum architecture using a group process. Now the group process was, you know, assembling a team for the purposes of analysis and or design. And the team is composed of master performers, what Tom Gilbert called exemplars. But, you know, my Motorola clients hated that word. It was a $3 college word guy. And, uh, you know, we don't like that. So we settled on master performers, and that's what I've been using ever since. Although the more prevalent term for this is subject matter experts, people who have domain knowledge and expertise. Well, I had been saddled with an SME to do a corporate training program for the purchasing organization at Motorola and my SME was the corporate SME for purchasing. So you would think he would know a lot about, you know, purchasing in the here and now. And uh, he didn't. Uh, he had been seven years removed from the field, so he didn't really know what was going on currently. And so my pilot bombed and I learned to not just ask for subject matter experts. I wanted master performers. I wanted those exemplars. and. My clients kind of understood that, yeah, there are people who know a lot about stuff, but they can't do anything. I mean, <laughs> you've been in business for a while. You've run across plenty of those kinds of people. Uh, Know-it-alls who can't do much of anything. Um, so I really wanted people, as I would say, you know, I wanted somebody who was doing this job to a level of mastery the day before we start the meeting. I want current, up-to-date people who know how to do the work, ideally. They know what the barriers are that need to be avoided and they know what to do if those barriers were unavoidable. And that's key. You know, we can't just teach people, you know, the work is as easy as one, two, three. It's one, two, three with a bunch of monkey wrenches thrown in. Barriers that arise 
sometimes all the times you know on r very rare occasions but nonetheless the the performers need to know how to contend with that how to avoid the barriers in the first place and what to do if they're unavoidable so that was a key part of the analysis data you know the ideal and the gap but anyway so I I strove to standardize my approach to curriculum architecture and I forced the staff that worked for me because I was in charge of our uh, instructional design part of the business and Ray and Karen were doing strategic planning for training functions and they were doing uh, performance improvement projects on occasion and I was the one who was handling all the training stuff if you will. Everybody to that point in my life that I'd come across in the training business wanted to be, become performance consultants and didn't want to do training. But, you know, that's where all of our revenues came from, the majority of our revenues anyway. And so I took that on. And I was able to then force my will upon my staff, who either did this to my standard or they didn't. And then they would, you know, hear about that. Um, but uh, so I, 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 this short-term pain for long-term gain is what the group process is all about. It's tough to be a facilitator with 8 to 12 master performers in the room, all with strong egos, all who know that they are master performers. In fact, I, you know, refer to them that way and they, you know, puff their chests out and be prideful of the fact that they were recognized by the client and the key stakeholders overseeing our project as master performers. And so the trick is to get them to articulate, you know, what is the, what are the performance tasks at somewhat of a nuanced level, but not too not nuanced for curriculum architecture design, because we don't know that the possible content of a curriculum architecture is actually worthy of investing in. It might be left as a gap forever. You know, we don't have it now. We don't. We'll never have it in the future because it's low hanging fruit, guy. There's no return on the investment for addressing that. Uh, but anyway, so we published this article in Training Magazine, and it talked about the approach to curriculum architecture, and, and it was different than what I had evolved it to by the time it came out, because it took 13 months after we submitted it to Training Magazine for it to get published. Um, anyway, so uh, and then two months after that, we had an article in NSPI, which is now ISPI, the International Society for Performance Improvement. They had a journal, the Performance improvement and tr and instruction journal um, and we published that and two months later on how to use this group process for conducting analysis so it was kind of the one-two punch we had submitted these articles in a manner that we thought that the analysis one would come out and then be followed up you know shortly thereafter with the design but they actually came out opposite uh, the curriculum architecture design article came out first um, I had also, uh, after that, in, in April of 1985, I did my first national presentation on the curriculum architecture design via a group process. I had also presented that at the Chicago chapter of NSPI in their fall con uh, mini conference um, back in 84. So I had begun writing about this, doing the projects, presenting on it, uh, standardizing the methodology, and evolving the methodology. Uh, and training and development paths were one of the key outputs. It was highly visual. We would produce these on blueprint paper. We had a local uh, vendor that uh, did blueprint drawings for, you know, the architects and draftsmen and the construction business in our local area out in the western suburbs of Chicago. And uh, so we would produce these and we would start it off calling them there was a training and development blueprint, which was all the modules of a curriculum architecture, and then we could construct various paths for the various target audience, should there be more than one, you know, in different parts of the business, like the supervisor thing. The uh, geologists and the geophysicists needed some things that were exactly the same and some different things because their jobs were different out there in the real world. And so we would create this collection of modules and organize them. We had a classification scheme that I was again evolving and we'd produce the training and development paths. A sequence of instruction 
a continuum of instruction. And that kind of fit with the whole notion of instructional systems design, looking at the entire job or a process or a set of processes or even an entire department, even an entire function like human resources with a bunch of different jobs in there. You know, people looking after performance appraisals, other than doing compensation studies. And some of them needed, you know, shareable content and others needed something that was quite unique because this is all supposed to be about performance, performance-based training and development, if you will. Um, so now CADs are conducted via four phases, and sometimes these change depending on if this is associated with another project, but my goal in creating four phases in my approach is that I wanted to check in with the client and the project steering team, the stakeholders, before I got too far down the road. I wanted them to look at the data that I had. Uh, we started off, uh, you know, look at the project plan and this is what it's all about. Does this make sense? Can we do this? Will you support it? Will you resource it? Because if you don't, <laughs> we need to replan. Uh, rather than stumble off and then learn that that's not going to work and we have to do something else and blowing schedules and budgets and, you know, expectations. So I wanted to set the expectations and fully get my client group, the project steering team, engaged and invested and owning the project plan. I wanted the project plan that I created to become theirs, not mine. And then we would review the analysis data after the analysis phase and make sure that they were okay with that because I would warn them, you know, if you don't stop me, I'm gonna use this data to create this curriculum architecture design. And another thing, I'm gonna take everything that could be group-paced training that also could be self-paced training and I'm gonna move it all into self-paced training unless you stop me now, unless you tell me differently. Well, they all like that notion, and so I was in, encouraged, empowered to do exactly that. Now, the world, the target in the target audience worlds, not everybody likes self-paced training. They want to go off to a classroom thing. They want to go and take a break from work, and you know, because self-paced training, you can do that on the job. Not everybody wanted that, but that's what I was doing to make it more flexible for the learners and for their management to manage people's development in a more timely basis than group pace training affords. So I've been on that kick since 1981, thanks to Bill Wiggenhorn. Um, but so the phases are the four phases, and now uh, we'll look at uh, a little bit more detail in a thing that I call the POTS, the phases, the outputs, and the tasks of a curriculum architecture design project. Now I would show this graphic or one similar to all my clients at the beginning of a project. This is how we're doing the work breakdown structure. Here's the phases, you know, here's what we're gonna produce phase by phase. I needed to manage their expectations. And I needed to make clear that at the end of the curriculum architecture design effort, there was no new training because I found that this was often confused by my clients who were busy thinking about other things, maybe in the meeting, maybe look like they're paying attention, but at some, some point they'd say, well, where's the new training? Well, curriculum architecture, like architecting or designing or engineering anything, doesn't produce it. It's the first early steps where you say, here's the design. Now, if this passes muster, let's go build it. Let's go buy things that we've already got or things that are available and build you know, the other stuff around it and create a product or a system, a, a composition of products. And so that was the notion and I needed to make sure that my clients understood that, that curriculum architecture designs led to what might be called ADDI level uh, efforts. Now I have a version of ADDI that's MCD, Modular Curriculum Development slash Acquisition. The acquisition is because we had uncovered content that already existed, that the shareholders had already paid for, and we were going to use that either as is or after modification. So reuse has been a big part of my approach to curriculum architecture designs since the very beginning, since I worked at Motorola and I supported manufacturing, materials, and purchasing. So I was well aware of the fact that there were components and sub-assemblies that went into multiple final products. And I had thought, well, instruction should be the same way. There are people that have shared content needs because they have shared knowledge and skill requirements because they have shared performance requirements. Um, and so there's got to be some other way than producing redundancies after redundancies after redundancies, increasing first costs 
and then killing you with their life cycle maintenance costs as you keep that content up to date. Well, let's look a little bit deeper at these uh, uh, these phases. Uh, first of all, we can take a look at you know what are the outputs phase by phase. You know, there's a project plan, and then in the analysis phase, we come up with uh, um, the target audience uh, description or definition. Um, we come up with a description of the performance, the performance requirement, what outputs and tasks, what, what's the current state of gaps from non-master performers compared to perf master performers who are performing at an ideal level, if you will. Maybe not perfect, but is, it's the best we've got. What are the knowledge and skills that are required? What's the existing content that we might use, reuse as is after modification? Then in the design, we come up with a, a training and development path that's composed of training and development events, which are composed of training and development modules or lessons. And later on in my more detailed methodology, MCD, we would take those modules and convert those into lessons. And we might take three modules and convert those into seven lessons or one lesson. It always depended, but I wanted to give myself a little flexibility. And then those lessons are composed of what I call instructional activities, which are basically information, demonstration, and applications. So practice and feedback. And we would backward design all of that, but that's another uh, methodology. And I'll describe that in a subsequent uh, video in this series. So I'd learned about uh, that from Motorola, this modular approach. Uh, how to look at things, kind of a work breakdown structure, which is what that graphic was. Um, and then I later on had a project with AT&T Network Systems product managers who managed 500,000 products across five business units, strategic business units at AT&T at Network Systems. This was the old Western Electric manufacturing arm of Ma Bell, AT&T, the Monopoly. Well, the Monopoly days had come and gone, and it was a new world. But I work with these people and learn even more about, you know, modular systems. Uh, you know, a system is made up of products, which is made up of subassemblies, which is made up of component parts. And there's raw parts, raw piece parts that, you know, it's a hierarchy. And that fit with my notion of curriculum architecture. And so I borrowed a lot of those concepts that I was learning in detail to create my own approach to architecture of instruction could have been called engineering of instruction if only Ray Svensson had labeled it as that back in 1981, but he called it curriculum architecture, and that's why it's called that today. So there's this whole thing about uh, instructional engineering, uh, learning engineering, uh, training engineering that's kind of coming up again. It's been around for actually quite a number of decades, um, but it's a similar kind of a notion. And when I look at people who are calling them, you know, learning architects, etc., I often wonder, you know, I don't see anything in what they're describing, unless they're hiding that from us, in terms of, so what is their approach to architecture? What's architectural about it in the first place? I have an advantage in that I, you know, my first semester at the University of Kansas, I was in the architecture program, and the second semester I was in radio TV film. <clears throat> I couldn't cut the math portion, uh, which was important not only in the math classes that I was taking, but in the physics classes that I was taking. And uh, I was not cut out to be a architect in that sense, but I became a training and development architect, an instructional architect. And so that's, that's what I've been doing. That's what I do. But anyway, so this reuse became a key goal. Um, but back to the phases. All right, so in the first phase, we're doing a, some project planning. So I have a structure where I've broken down each of the phases. So in phase one, it's all about project planning and kickoff. What's key, what's critical there is the approved project plan. A project plan that's just not summarily approved because, yeah, get on with it, guy. No, I want them to understand, here's the timing, here's the burden, and here's where you at the project steering team level need to come back together in a meeting face to face with me, because it was the old days, um, and take a look at what I've got. I've got things I want to show you. I've got qu questions. I've got challenges. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do next unless you stop me now. So hear me out. And I would tell clients, as I see it, this, this mechanism at the end of each phase, which was the uh, gate review meetings with the project steering team, was a exercise in command and control 
and empowerment. They loved the command and control part because they wanted to be in control. Um, they wanted to be able to tell me what to do and what not to do. But here I was adding this word empowerment to that and I would tell them, look, you need to license me, approve what I'm going to go do because I'm going to tell you now that you've approved the data from this phase, here's what I'm going to go do in the next phase. Hear me now, believe me later, as they said on Saturday Night Live back in the day. Um, so I'm going to go do that. And if that doesn't sound right to you, stop me now. And what I'm going to go do, I know, is going to be controversial with some groups, and I need your support. So if you have questions about Guy, why would you go do that? Well, let's talk about it now. This, is, this gate review meeting is for me to run the gauntlet of a gate review meeting and answer the challenging questions and satisfy my customer as a client group, as a project steering team, in what was going on and what we had done and how we had done it. Now, we used master performers that were handpicked by the project steering team, a key to success in almost anything. If your clients can pick out your sources for data and you bring back stuff that they don't like, whose fault is that? Well, they pick the master performers. The master performers said, this is ideal. This is what's going on. This is what's screwed up. This is what needs to be addressed and fixed. If the clients don't like that, it's kind of their own damn fault for having picked those that group of master performers who I col collected together and generated data that was a consensus, unless there were exceptions, and I would capture that and read that out too if there were, that's happened on occasion, rare occasion. But, so this was the consensus view of ideal performance, what the gaps were, what the enabling knowledge and skills were, and if that was satisfactory, then we would move forward. And of course, this often caused a lot of consternation on the project steering team who may have been un unknowing about some of the details of the gaps or were in denial about some of the gaps and their probable root causes. But I was also showing my clients when I read out the data, the analysis data in particular, that you know here's the performance situation and here's the things that training can address and there's other things going on that can't be addressed. So maybe you guys want to go tackle that and establish some uh, critical action teams uh, as, as they're sometimes called but you know groups that go out there and make fixes to the environmental supports the process itself and you know we in the training biz will take care of the knowledge and skills that we can give people to start them up the learning curve you know we never pretended that you know we could address everybody's last learning need um, we can't we can get them started though and then they can continue their learning on the job um, on their way to becoming the next crop of master performers. Um, so again, I want to go back to reuse. So a lot of these, so when I started going from a simple path with modules on the path and I started thinking about the hierarchy in an ar architectural sense, so I have uh, an entire inventory of content, if you will, and from that I can take and create training and development paths and reusing content and identifying where are our current state gaps so that they can be prioritized high, medium, low, or zero, which means we're never going to spend a nickel on that. And if we called something out that was a valid learning need, a training and development need because it's a knowledge and skill requirement, and the client group didn't want to spend any money on it, well, I would call that unstructured OJT. They're going to learn it on the job by hook or by crook. You know, decades later, we started calling these things informal learning. Um, but, but that would be the rare things, the things that weren't high impact to the organization. And I let the customers at the project steering team level decide that. Um, but when you start modularizing your content at different levels, it's just not a module, a chunk of content, uh, the old uh, uh, learning object, uh, which I hated that uh, concept when it came around because I'd been doing so much better than that to, to start with. Um, because if you're going to have shareable learning objects, they've got to be so generic that it fits everybody's needs. Well, that's no good if it's not specific enough, authentic enough. Uh, to the target audience, it's not gonna. They could learn it, but it's not likely to transfer back to the job. And isn't that the goal? Is to have good stuff transfer back to the job and improve performance, rather than people passing knowledge tests. 
But this whole issue begs a need for creating what I would I call the five tier module inventory. And this is where I would house different kinds of content. And this is my model here. It starts off with tier one, which is organizational orientations. You know, welcome to this, the big corporation. Welcome to the strategic business unit. Welcome to your division. Welcome to your site. Welcome to your job. And so people need to have all of that kind of stuff demystified so they understand, you know, as a cog in the great big machinery, where the heck am I? How, what, you know, what other parts of the machinery are there? You know, so can I find myself in that and understand my performance objectives within the context of something greater and greater and greater? Uh, and so that was the need. So the second is, um, uh, uh, performance orientations. So this is basically advanced organizers. Guy is an instructional uh, uh, designer. You're going to do design. Yeah, but before you do that, you're going to do analysis. And before that, you're going to do project planning and kickoff. And after design, you're going to do development. And after development, you're going to do pilot testing. This is my model, not the Addy model. And after pilot testing, you're going to do revisions and release. And you're going to put the content at a place where it can be accessible to other people. Or we're going to, you know, we're either going to let them pull or we're going to push it out to them, depending on who they are and how critical this is to getting their job done. So, uh, the so I need to demystify for people. What the hell are these chunks of the job? Uh, what could be called key responsibility areas or major duties or Gilbert's term accomplishments. Guy has called them areas of performance for a very long time. But again, there's other names for them and they usually have nuanced meanings to people. And so to avoid all that, I just created something that was, you know, uh, similar but different. Is I would say. And uh, so it's just a way to chunk out the job, but people need to have that demystified before they start learning all of the various knowledge and skills. So between tier two and tier four, if you look at that, that's uh, shared performance because there's many people who share performance, elements of performance, tasks and outputs across many different job populations. And then tier five is the stuff that's unique to a job title. So product planners and product managers do a certain set of things, but other people in the marketing organization do different things. So some of their things are shared tier four content, and some of those are quite unique tier five. Um, and in the middle tier three are all the enabling knowledge and skills. So that's where you'd find active listening. Just about everybody needs active listening, but their job performance application of active listening might be different enough that you can't train everybody on active listening and have them go back to their jobs and successfully transfer that and use that and have better improved performance. So, uh, so the tier three content is where you find most of the shareable content across many, many, many different job target audiences within an enterprise. Tier four, you're gonna find a lot of shared content as well. And of course, tier one, you know, welcome to the enterprise. Well, everybody needs that. Welcome to the strategic business unit. Everybody in the strategic business unit needs that. And other people and other strategic business units might need that as well because they work closely with that business unit. And so therefore you need to know something about them. You know, who are they? Uh, how are they organized? Uh, what are their products and services? What's their functionality inside the enterprise? Oh. Uh, that can be demystified. Now you know whether or not that's the right group to try to work with, or maybe it's some other group. But it's a way to, you know, f uh, find your way uh, through the maze of a modern enterprise. Unless it's a small organization, you know, it's not easy for some people to come up quickly to speed on all of that. And we can provide them with this kind of help. Um, so I, I went from this very simple approach in architecture to just chunks of content, modules. And then I started evolving it to this different level. The path composed of training and development events, which themselves are composed of training and development modules or lessons. And those lessons are composed of instructional activities, blah, blah, blah. Um, so there's this whole need to then organize all this content if you're really considering reuse. You know, where can people find this stuff? Well, there needs to be a central repository of the master materials, if you will, so that I can take that 
uh, active listing content and create a derivative because that one was created for salespeople because salespeople really need to know how to active listening. But I got people at the customer complaint department and they have a different kind of active listening. Uh, it's a little bit more heated and so I'm going to need to change some of that content but there's no sense in reinventing active listening all over again. I might as well take the content that already exists and do plug and play pull things out that are too specific to a different target audience and their performance requirements and plug in the content that's authentic authentic enough not perfectly authentic but authentic enough to work how can you tell it work because it transfers back to the job that's the acid test not some pilot test where everybody learns something and they score well on the knowledge test and they score well on a performance test within the class environment the course environment no, it's got to actually go back out to the job and they got to str maybe struggle with it because it's not easy. Things aren't easily transferred just because you learned it in a classroom or a training environment. But did it really transfer? Did it stick out there? Not stick in the classroom, not stick for your knowledge tests. Anyway, so that's the concept of that. So training and development paths, as I've been calling them since 1981, um, later on in the mid to late 2000s, you know, 2005 to 2010, became more prevalently known across the business as learning paths. Now, there was a book out there, uh, a fellow that I knew from uh, NSPI, ISPI back in the day, uh, wrote this book with, an, with another person. I, I, I don't remember the other person's name. But anyway, so they had a book out on learning paths. And, and this is all the whole shift starting in the early 90s because of Peter Senge's book The Fifth Discipline and you know becoming a learning organization and all my clients were changing their names from the training department of some sort to the learning department learning and development you know, training and development became learning and development well you know what I thought having read the book and, and understood it well enough that you know the learning organization wasn't this training department it was the entire enterprise and it had zero to do with the offerings of the training department that's now known as the learning department. Um, uh, but anyway, so the world kind of moved on from Guy, but Guy stuck to where he was for the most part. And I've been calling it training and development and training and development paths fairly consistency, uh, consistently. I have at times called it learning paths and learning and development, but I've uh, several years ago went back to strictly calling it training and development because I think training is is very different and, and it conveys connotes something more specific um, and I won't get into that now I've talked about that earlier in these uh, series of videos um, so my even my 1985 presentation at NSPI I called it training and development paths paths they are a subset of the world of content that is put in some suggested sequence and one of the tricks is we're wanting to make sure that you know a training and development path is performanceized first it reflects the performance requirements no kidding and it doesn't have a bunch of foo-foo content on there that has face validity but it's really oriented and and intended to help the people learn how to perform how to perform tasks to produce outputs to the stakeholder requirements I mean that's the game um, and then, but we have a need to personalize that then because just because we can say, here's a path of sequenced content, it makes sense that this leads to that, that then leads to that, that then leads to these other things. That makes sense, but you know, just because somebody has the same job title as others doesn't mean that their job assignment is the same or even very much alike. Sometimes it can be quite different. Um, and then they all bring in a unique set of knowledge and skills based on their education and experience. And we have to account for that. So it's never been my concept that a training and development path is exactly what everybody needs. Oh no, it's, it's really got to account for that person being able to skip content because they already know that. Why should we train them on things that they already know? That's a waste of shareholder equity. So. When I modulize content, it's usually driven by the fact that some of the target audience is going to know this and others aren't. Break that into two modules here so that we don't force anybody to the trough to drink when they've already been sated with water. Um, so 
one notion, a phrase that I came up with, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, was that training and development paths should be as rigorous as required and as flexible as feasible. I was dealing with seeing others come up with, you know, ways to create training development paths, learning paths. And, you know, I watched a video one time of somebody who said, okay, you take a, you know, put some flip chart paper down on the table. And now you take all of your courses that you've got and you arrange it in a sequence. You know, this, uh, that's, that's one way to do it. Maybe that's better than nothing. But what you're missing is what's, where are the gaps? And are those gaps critical? Is what you put on the path a bunch of the easy stuff, the things that had face validity across a bunch of audiences, and therefore the content is, isn't even generated too often by an analysis of the performance requirements and what the enabling knowledge and skills are and then carefully crafted to address that performance context, or do you have a bunch of generic content? And each title has face validity. Oh yeah, active listening, everybody needs that. Oh yeah, how to log into the system, everybody needs that. Oh yeah, how to use spreadsheets, oh yeah, everybody needs that. Well, maybe the different applications for spreadsheets is quite different and the functionality within the spreadsheet program, people need different things. And so too often the training business, the learning business has gone after this generic content and you can buy libraries and fill up your LMS with a whole bunch of generic content. And what good is that? And if you put it into a path, maybe that's okay. But I think it's the wrong approach. Uh, and my approach has been very different. So I like to personalize or performanceize the content first and then allow people to personalize it. We do this through the mechanism that I've been doing for a long time, which I call the Training Development Individual Development Plan, IDP. An IDP was a concept that was known back in the 80s. Um, I just have a particular spin on it. So you take my training and development path and you take a look at all the courses that could be and you down select everything that the learner needs. And the, the learner and their boss should be doing this together most often, I think. Um, and then you resequence it because there may be things down the path a ways that you need next week. And so you should take that training tomorrow, guy. And so we can resequence those things and create a development plan that's keyed, geared towards serving the needs of a single individual, not the masses with the same job title, not the masses in the same department, but constructing an individualized, personalized training and development plan that's based off of a curriculum architecture design and a training development path that is focused on the performance requirements, the outputs, and the tasks, and the stakeholder measures for both. And that's the goal. So, um, so I, the best example of this was from uh, a project I did, a curriculum architecture design project for AT&T Network Systems product managers, as I had mentioned. And uh, they had put together the very first module in the architecture that shows all the content um, the very first one was a video that explained the whole dang thing and demystified the notion because this was a new notion they nobody had been doing this in the past if you'd been knocking around the AT&T system and landed in product management uh, you knew that there was a course catalog you know alphabetically organized or here's all the engineering stuff and here's all the stuff for the information uh, instruct uh, information technology folks and here's stuff you know, for all the various target audience, they could arrange it in that way as a way to kind of pare it down and provide some focus. But this whole notion of a training and development path was quite unique. And so they did a video, I think the video came out in either 1988 or 89, um, that demystified the whole notion. And the video included a focus on developing an individual's training and development plan and what that concept was. You've got this path, you down select what you need and you resequence it uh, based on the timing requirements of your job, tasks, responsibilities, and what was coming up on the calendar. Um, so that's a good example and uh, I'll share uh, that, that video's URL because it's up on YouTube. My client gave me uh, a, a copy of the video to use for marketing purposes and so I have been doing so. In 1999, I published my book, Lean ISD, after starting it back in 1983 uh, as the Curriculum Manager's Handbook. And Lean ISD covers 
these analysis methodologies, curriculum architecture design, um, MCD, modular curriculum development slash acquisition, as well as the third level in my approach to design, uh, instructional activity development slash acquisition, because again, part of the goal and what I wanted to do is reinforce this was that sometimes we can acquire content that exists, we bought it out in the marketplace, and we bookended it or adjusted it in some manner um, to make it more authentic to our target audiences. And so I always wanted to reinforce that notion that we, just because we've called out some things and we found some content that's you know close but not close enough, well, we should take that content that's close but not close enough and fix it, address it, you know, plug and play, pull out the stuff that's too specific to some other job and plug in the stuff that's specific to the target audience that we're trying to serve. So this has never been about serving mass audiences, but to create configurations of content that might serve future audiences as is or after modification, uh, a, a very key concept. But I took the book Lean ISD and a couple of other books, uh, Ray and Karen and I had written a book, The Quality Roadmap, back in 94, which was the marriage of uh, human performance technology, if you will, to TQM, Total Quality Management. So I had all that content, been kicking around. I had written a book in 2001, The Training and Development Systems View book, uh, another book on management areas of performance. But I was taking some of my old writings and I reconfigured them into a six pack Kind of like uh, Mager's six pack, you know, my friend Bob Mager, when I told him that I had done that, he kind of laughed and wished me well. Um, but anyway, so I created my six pack of my methodologies and I was trying to configure that content to align more closely to the target audiences. So managers of training departments uh, might read the curriculum manager's handbook. Analysts would read, you know, how to analyze uh, performance competence requirements. People that were involved at the project management or the design level and CAD would read the book on curriculum architecture design. Uh, people who were doing the ADDIE level, uh, SAM level, the design thinking level might take my read my book on MCD, modular curriculum development slash acquisition. Um, and then there was a book on how to look at uh, uh, ma management responsibilities, which is basically taking, okay, you've got a department or a function. What are all the outputs and task sets involved in that? Well, I have a way to kind of uh, start with a straw man model, if you will, and you can bayonet a straw man model. And that's what you do that, and you cut it up, and you fix it, and you change the language to meet the language requirements, the, the language in use in your organization. But here's a jump start for taking a look at what a manager is responsible for, um, and not just their job tasks, but the job tasks of the people in their employ. Um, and so, you know, how to help them leverage their performance as a organizational unit, if you will. And then the final book in the series is about how to move from training to performance-based training to performance improvement consulting. Now, there's a lot of books out on this. This is my take. This leverages off of my instructional systems design methodology. And if somebody had mastered all of that, then it's a smooth segue to looking beyond knowledge and skills beyond training to look at all the variables of performance as you help your clients either design greenfield operations to you know perform well from the very get-go or whether you're going in there as a repair service to help them fix their performance issues and address them uh, with things other than training and even if you're in charge of an effort like that and you're leading that effort you may not be uh, have the knowledge and skills, the expertise to make all the fixes. Can you know? Can you write the new software program as a tool to help in the new process? No, but you can help your clients address the real root causes of their performance issues or their opportunities to improve and do even better. You know, appreciative inquiry kind of approach to things rather than always problem solving. Um, so there's a way that we can help. We can go beyond instruction and help them find, you know, uh, solution sets that might or may not include instruction, 
um, but we can help them improve performance and that should be the game. So that was that what that book is about. So curriculum architecture is my thing. I've done 76 of them as a consultant since 1982. Uh, and so I've done 77 in total if we include the one from uh, Motorola's time. Uh, the last one that I did was in the, the fall and winter of 2018 before I took the year off in 2019 to have two knees replaced, plug and play. Um, and uh, so uh, then here we are in 2020 and we have the pandemic that we're all dealing with. And uh, so things have slowed down and I don't know if I'll be doing curriculum architecture work in the future. I hope to. Uh, it's my passion, if you will, and has been for quite a long time. So that's my story about curriculum architecture designs in this 10th part edition of my adventures in performance-based training and development with your host, me, Guy Wallace, and the series of course is also known as the Insomnia Solution. But not for my insomnia, but for yours. Just kidding about that. Cheers.